What do you get when you take some therapists and put them in front of a screen to watch something creeping back from childhood that should have never been for children and preteens? They're gonna dive right in and reassess those flicks. What's more scary and disturbing than you realize and gave you nervous ticks? They're the movies that traumatized us. You know, guys, uh, some of you were just talking about this. If you haven't watched The Land Before Time, you should definitely watch The Land Before Time. Uh, the Land Before Time is is an amazing movie. Um, and anybody who's watched our previous streams knows I'm a total animation and practical effects junkie. So good animation uh, and good practical effects always make me really, really happy when we're reviewing a movie. Land Before Time has some of the best old school animation, kind of like The Last Unicorn without the whole, like, american anime thing going on with it um mm -hmm. but honestly did you, you know did you you know what you didn't make us and send me our fucked on blues graphic i know that's what i was saying before denver bear hunter said you, you know couldn't hear me i can't hear you <laughs> i didn't i for, i didn't have time to make the fuck you don blues even though we love don bluth we do love don bluth seriously. don't take our fuck you don bluth as anything more than pure love for don bluth and his ability to strike a chord on our empathy nerve but seriously, fuck you, Don Bluth. So, I don't know, did, um... What Can was we make it? a shirt that says that? Fuck you, Don Bluth? I, I thought we were talking about it. Um, didn't we... What was the last... Didn't we do another Don Bluth movie recently? Yeah, we did, uh, of Wrath of Nim. Yeah, The Secret of Nim. So, the same animation as Secret of Nim. If you guys watch The Secret of Nim cast, like, you, you know how much I love The Secret of Nim. You know, it feels great. I'm back from vacation. I'm, like, kind of out of my weird antisocial funk. <laughs> what? Yes, we all know how much you love the secret of Nim. Not a boop. No. I'm rule thirty-four. No. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of moments where the therapist did the traumatizing, we're gonna do that here again. The boob tree was the last unicorn. Thank you. Right. <laughs> let's let's leave the dendrophiliacs out of this, okay? The, the Fibonari was. The last unicorn. Yes, the last unicorn was all the futa. We don't. We don't need to. We don't need to. Let's not bring that up again, okay? I'm okay with bringing up the fact that we rule 34 to everybody on accident. Okay, I'm okay with that. That's that's a thing that happened. I just have to accept that. On accident. It was. It was on accident. I don't. Know. I don't know what you think it was like. It definitely wasn't on purpose. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, the last thing I want to do is get banned by Twitch for being like, ah, you rule 34 your viewers, you asshole. Like, I, I mean, mean, they let... Okay, so they have let us, by us I mean me and Chill Quill, play Lust from Beyond <laughs> on these streams. And they have said nothing. I mean, okay. One hurt. I mean, that's that's all good and fine and, and dandy. Like, <laughs> how how intense is lust from beyond? Um, there's a lot of vaginas and penises. <laughs> there's a lot of vaginas. <laughs> and one, okay, so a doctor, I know we're not talking about Land Before Time right now. But a That's doctor okay. that wants to get you to do, like, this weird cosmic sex cult actually gives you a blowjob for you to go into the beyond to make some of this stuff happen. Well, folks, uh, it's been a pleasure being able to stream for you on a regular basis. What, are you trying to get my channel banned already? Jeez Louise! <laughs> Maybe I mean if that's the case, maybe I need to be maybe I need to be playing my uh, my shoju game up there on Twitch. Maybe. <laughs> and now someone's gonna flag us because I said that. <laughs> They're gonna go back and look at our shit. <laughs> like just go delete the videos. Hurry up. Yeah. All right. So, anyways, um, we'll we'll we'll, we'll bring it back around. I mean, this is the movies that traumatize people, not the games that we use to traumatize people. Come on now. Um, 
And Land Before Time is a far cry from Lust from Beyond. <laughs> that is true. Land Before Time is a very far cry from Lust from Beyond. I mean, well, I don't know. Some people might Lust from Beyond for Sarah. You know, they got that weird dinosaur love. Oh, the dinosaur. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't talking about the... the... What did you think I was talking about? I didn't know if you were having that, like, uh, an I love me moment. <laughs> Hello. I'm here to talk to you tonight about love for myself. And the cosmic aura oh. Dulu. <laughs> I've seen enough hentai to know where this is going. Hey, form. listen, I got plenty of tentacles right behind me. Everybody can see them. <laughs> or it could be like the drawn together where the princess has tentacles in her her vagina. <laughs> So again, but we're talking about Land Before Time, which has nothing to do with tentacles. I mean, you know, now I kind of want to see a Land Before Time where the Kraken comes out of the ground and like just. Yeah, that's what really happened. That's what really happened in the valley. You know, like the Kraken came up and got everybody. <laughs> Denver Barrister says he's traumatized already. We oh, have done even, our job. Hey, listen, I haven't even gotten to the trauma of this movie yet, okay? And 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 I guarantee you tonight I am going to be responsible once again for spreading trauma around instead of talking about how trauma was done. I am going to cause more trauma. It's 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 just it's a fact. Land before time trauma. So a lot of this movie um for those of you that have seen it, you know, uh, for those of that you don't, sorry, we're going to give you a lot of spoilers tonight, as well as show you probably the majority of the movie off and on through clips. If you have not seen the movie by now, since it came out in the 80s, I'm sorry, spoilers are going to fucking happen. Well, I mean, listen, come on, a lot of our viewers are probably 90s and 2000s babies. Well, I'm sorry you were not born in a great generation like ours, so... Spoilers! Yeah, you're gonna get spoilers. If you haven't seen this movie by now, you're gonna get spoilers. If you've seen the cartoons, then you kind of know what it's about. But, you know, maybe not. Since all the cartoons were happen after um, this part get takes place. Get to the Great Valley. Because, the, yeah, because getting to the, the Great Valley, which, by the way, sounds like a total euphemism for a vagina, the Great Valley. I just... <laughs> With the tentacles. <laughs> Kraken! <laughs> From the Great Valley. <laughs> we will actually talk about this movie, I promise. I, well, well, you know, we always spend like the first 45 minutes talking about everything other than the movie. Uh, I just want to be, yeah. to be fair, like that's, that's usually how this goes. We, we do a lot of build up. Uh, hey, listen, we're not going to talk about the tree stars yet, okay? We're getting to the tree stars. Slow your roll, Denver Bear Hunter. Slow your roll. Okay. Right. Good lord. And how it didn't make it all the way to the Great Valley, which was kind of a... And it was supposed to be his guide, and that was the whole purpose of it? How is a leaf a map? I don't... I don't I know, don't but that. she was like, let it guide you. That's horseshit. I mean, come on. She impressed upon a... what? How old was Littlefoot at this point? He wasn't even a year old. He's like, what? Six a weeks? Month. A month? <laughs> like, like, this six-week-old fucking... A Patasaurus, or maybe he's a Brachiosaurus, I can't remember. He's got to find his way through all of this death and destruction as the world is crumbling around him. Uh, he's got to find this great valley. With and... the rock that looks like a long neck. Yes, yes, by the yes, exactly, yes, exactly. I am sorry, kid, but uh, you got to find a great valley on your own. I hope you have a fun time out there. You'll be good. You got this. You got this. It is what Reuter said. <laughs> I, it kind of is what Reuter says to him. We'll get to that. I promise, guys. I promise. We will get to Reuter. You know, I like Reuter. Reuter is one of those characters. He kind of shows up in every film like this. He's just that old, wise character who's crotchety at the same time. You know, kind of reminds me of Soldier 76 from Overwatch. Young punks, get off my lawn. You know? <laughs> Or it's the, hey, the, it's in the hero's journey where it's like, 
going to usher you even on to this even farther. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But so Littlefoot, you know, he's he's this long neck and you know, he has a friend who's a, a three horn and a flyer and uh, it, it, what does Ducky count as? I forgot what they called Ducky. Big mouth. Big mouth. That's right. Is it, Ducky is a duckbill pla- or duckbill platypus. She's <laughs> a duckbill dinosaur. And then you've got, uh, who am I missing? Spike. Spike. Who's He's supposed to be a stegosaurus, tail. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But for some reason or another, Spike is dumb as a box of rocks. And he just wants to eat and sleep. I feel bad for Spike because Spike is one of those characters that would be so lovable. But, like, why did they make him dumb? You gotta talk to Don Bluth about that one. Like, again, I just, I don't get it. Uh, so anyways, you know, more to the point, the movie itself. Um, and, and yes, absolutely, uh, uh, Denver Bear Hunter. That, that, that is a line that everybody who has seen this movie, uh, absolutely, uh, remembers iconically from the movie is, yep, yep, yep. Nope, nope, nope. Nope, nope, nope. Yep, yep, yep. We all remember Ducky. And I don't want to talk about Ducky just yet. We're going to talk about Ducky when we get to Ducky because Ducky is awesome. Like, Ducky is just one of those characters that you can't help but love. Um, and, and we'll talk about Ducky when we get to Ducky. But until we get there, we're, we're just going to we're gonna let that slide. We're going to leave that there alone by itself, sitting in the corner in the dark. <laughs> wow. Sorry, Ducky. <laughs> like, oh, actually, that's hitting me in the feels now. <laughs> I'm just going to shut up. So let's cut to our first clip. And get started. Nope, 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 nope. Don't even start that shit. No, 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 no. We're not going there. Not going there. Uh, so with that being said, uh, let's cut to this first clip. This first clip is uh, is actually the the uh, the birth of of Littlefoot. And uh, so also, uh, therapist Nikki, let me know you guys uh, can't always hear us over the clips. So I want to make sure the clips are loud enough that you can hear, but I still want you guys to be able to hear us. So if we're talking over the clip and you can hear us and not the clip, I'm okay with that. But if you can't hear us and you can hear the clip, I'm not okay with that. So somebody please chime in and let me know uh, what's happening there. But we'll get to this first clip. This is actually the birth of Littlefoot. Um, and, One you know, Littlefoot wandering baby. into the world. Their last hope for the future. The last hope for the future is this pudgy <laughs> little ass. Him. Little Let me show you the asshole. You sure he isn't part cat? <laughs> if I was Littlefoot, that would be the most terrifying thing. That big ass face coming in and then licking my butt. Like, what the fuck, man? What are you doing? And he likes it. And this is how Littlefoot gets an ass eating fetish. Right? Absolutely adorable fucking little dinosaur. You gotta love the way they drew him. He's so cute. Like that timid, I don't know what you are, let me run away, I can barely walk. Don't be frightened. Come out. Oh, you just wanna hold him and be like, it's okay. It's okay. I just love that. It's so lamb. It's so. No, I was gonna say lamb before time right here. <laughs> it's so. Uh, Bambi. No. Um, Lion King with everybody coming to see him. They did that with Bambi too. Yeah, I guess that was Bambi too. You're right. Oh, we should do Bambi. Oh my God. Of his herd was his mother, <laughs> grandmother. We can do Bambi. And his grandfather. Bambi would be great. He knew them by sight, by scent. Bambi's another movie that caused a bunch of furry fetishes, I guarantee it. Oh yeah. You Twitter painted. My little foot. The thing that kills me is how little he is and how big he will become. Right. <laughs> like, the disparity between some dinosaurs when they're born and what they end up as, as an adult, is Beautiful just fucking monstrous. I mean, we can go back to Jurassic Park in the 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 podcast that shall not ever air. <laughs> you know, I feel bad that that podcast got so broken. I mean, we could try it again at some point. I would I would redo the Jurassic Park podcast at some point just to to have our our that was that was a third podcast that we did, right? 
Right. That's when I like fucked up my camera. And <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> Our audio was out. completely fucked, and we said no to Twitch Studio after that. Like, <laughs> like everything <laughs> that could go wrong went wrong on that stream. But here we see the birth of Littlefoot, right? And this is that moment in the in the story. Um, you know, you kind of get the idea that he's going to be kind of put on a journey on his own uh, just by hearing that he's the last hope, um, you know, for his kind. You know, at least in, in this section of the world, he's, he's the last of his kind being born. Um, all, all that's left is his mom and his grandparents uh, and then him. And then, of course, you know, we see some of the flyers and some of the other dinosaurs that kind of come around and, and hang out and check out the, the birth of this new baby. Um, but in a what little if, while from this scene, huh? What happened to his dad? They never explained that. I mean, you know... Well, I was going to say Don Bluth's not like Disney and doesn't kill parents, but that's a lie! <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> There's a reason why we say fuck you, Don, Don Bluth. Bluth. Yes. And you know what? For the past two, it's been the dad. You know what? It has. The dad has been missing in the past. Two. So Lamba or uh, the secret of Nim. Jonathan is dead. All that's left is mom and the kids. And now we have Littlefoot and his mom and his grandparents. Yeah. Where's dad? You know, maybe Don Bluth had a thing about absentee fathers. Maybe. And I don't just want to point at fathers and say it's only fathers who are absentee. Let's be clear. Absentee parent. Mm -hmm. It can be any side of that fence that you can be an absentee parent. But that's that's not... <laughs> that, that, that's another story. That's a, that's a story for another time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Littlefoot, and then we figure... And then we have, like, segregation that comes up. Oh man, did we? Well, yeah, we're gonna get. So that's that's next because we start. Littlefoot meets a friend, right? And he meets his friend Sarah. Is Sarah really a friend though? I mean, she's definitely a bitch. I mean, I was gonna say. Let, let's be honest. She's kind of a cunt. <laughs> I mean, I can't. I can't argue that fact. But just <laughs> wow, we're we're gonna go. We're just gonna jump right in, folks. She's a cunt. Okay, I got it. We're just jumping right. We're just going right for the big dig on that. She is. Yeah. But you know what? Let's be fair. Um, At some point in this movie, guys, to be fair, she grows out of it. But let's talk about how this sort of systemic speciesism or racism kind of gets put in place in her childhood. And she has to learn to overcome it, right? This is definitely a, a thing that she has to learn how to overcome. And that only happens when she gets uh, separated later from her own kind. And she's forced to sort of uh, travel with... Well, she's not even sort of forced. She is forced to travel with this group of misfits uh, who... They have to make up their own herd. Right. They have to make their own herd and they have to find out how to survive on their own. And it's not until she's forced to do that that she really starts to overcome that that systemic hatred that's been put in place by her parents. So to, to talk about that, let, let's take a look at, at what happens uh, here because this is kind of a big deal. And I remember when we were watching this, both of us were just like, holy crap, her parents were assholes. Right. And her parents really are assholes. And this is what I want you guys to take a look at it and you see it even today with kids you see it with kids kids don't see anything other than people and i love that about children for kids there isn't anything there but people that they want to play with and that's what we see here so let's take a peek at this little foot in his damn tree star oh those are so addictive little foot, don't you wander too far is that bug like square in the face? Hey! Yup. 
you. It's got to stink, man. What are you laughing at? <gasps> he doesn't even back down from this challenge. No, nope, he's just like, yeah, I'm gonna hit you. And the dad. Come, Sarah. Three horns never play with long necks. Just the way he says it. Three horns never play with long necks. The thing is, is that freaking Littlefoot's mom could straight up just club him with her tail and end his fucking life. <laughs> just right. like, What's all she's got to do is swing that big ass booty around and it's done. I like how he like holds on to his tail for a harness. You know, Maximum Chaos, we're not talking about that until we get to Ducky. So, like I told Denver Bear Hunter, you're just gonna leave that yup 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 right the fuck there at the door, okay? It stays put until we get there, because then I'll traumatize everybody. Why? Well, because we're different. I thought we were gonna save that for all dogs go to heaven. Nah, nah, I, nah, because it really, like, this is the movie that everybody thinks about it on. Right. If, if we want to be entirely honest. So what we see here is just sort of this this systemic hatred that gets implanted in Sarah really early. And this kind of separation of like, I can't play with you because you're not my kind. Um, and it's really bullshit, right? Because it almost sets Sarah up for a lot of failure uh, later in this movie. And okay. she struggles really, really hard to overcome that uh that kind of mentality that was put into her head uh by her parents um and it's a really kind of dark thing that, that they that they set in stone for her and it goes to show that all it takes is you sort of displaying this trait one time for a kid to really follow through with it even today when you look at if we're going to i'm going to segue to politics for just one minute okay i don't like politics i don't like talking about politics we're going to segue over. So the kids, children usually take on the opinion of their parents or their caregivers because that's the opinion that they're hearing. They're not looking at the bigger issues. They're not looking at research because they don't really know how to do this for themselves yet. Right. So, and, but that, but that ingrained thing can carry on through the generation if they don't learn how to think for themselves well and that's and that's very true and you know i was we have a lot of that high in, you know that that anti-intellectualist uh kind of movement happening and and, and we're going to segue right off politics because i don't want to get caught on that but you know that it, it's really a big thing teaching people to think for themselves and to understand is, is super important and sarah is forced to do that and this is what i want to make very clear this is what happens to Sarah. She is forced to think for herself and kind of confront her realities as the movie goes on. And each one of these characters sort of has their own, and, and I think this is important to understand, all of these characters, whether we're talking about Littlefoot, Sarah, Petrie, uh, Ducky, Spike, they all have something that they have to overcome throughout the course of this movie. And while, yeah, not everybody gets as much time on, in this film as Littlefoot and Sarah do, because they definitely get the majority of the time, um, everybody has to overcome it. Petrie, hmm. when we get to Petrie, Petrie is riddled with anxiety. It's like this inferiority and an insecurity. And he's of afraid, of afraid of, of yeah, and he's, a, and he has to overcome that. And when he does, he kind of finds his own self-worth in that. And it's super important. And you guys will see that when we get there. But, you know, and, and the same can be said for Ducky. Ducky has this kind of need to, to just be a, a, almost a people pleaser in a way. He is a people pleaser. Yeah, Ducky really just is like, oh, no, no, it's it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. We can do this. Yep, 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 we can do it, we can do it. And, and you know, and I mean, it, there's, there's a lot of what you see in this is all these little things that kind of can develop into something that's far worse later in life if you don't learn how to deal with it early on. Or mm -hmm. nobody teaches you a better way to handle it early on, right? And then you have to kind of unlearn these behaviors that you've been doing for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And that can be really fucking hard. 
Right. And I mean, you have Spike who was left behind, thought of as, I guess, a bad egg that wouldn't hatch. And so you have like Sloth. Yeah. Just being different. Yeah, exactly. And he is. And he's. But, you know, it's funny because, well, I mean, we'll get there. But Spike is, again, I was talking about this earlier. Spike has this really, the potential to be this really awesome character that they just never really explored. I feel like he, speaking of, got the short end of the stick. <laughs> like, well, they, they explored him later in the other movies, like once the franchise branched out. Right, yeah, after it kind of took off into its own thing. And he really kind of came into his own later. But in this movie, he's very much a kind of just this, this empty-headed space that doesn't really do much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I hate to say that, uh, but it is it is what it is. So, Littlefoot's born. He gets separated from Sarah. Sarah gets taught some really bad lessons from her parents, and they all start this mass migration to the Great Valley. The Great Valley. That's right. The uh, Great Valley. <laughs> the Great Valley. <laughs> so nice. Where it's supposed to be, I, and I'm only reason I keep making that reference for the Great Valley is because it is supposed to be this green and fertile place full of life. <laughs> You're like son of a bitch. I was about to shoot seltzer out my nose. Thank you. <laughs> But, <laughs> so... The bubbles! Nah. Hey, listen. I watch a lot of Powerpuff Girls now. I, I, okay, so I love the Powerpuff Girls. We're going to segue off for a second because she said bubbles and now I've got Powerpuff Girls on the brain. So I introduced my daughter to Powerpuff Girls like three weeks ago. I mean, it is like all she wants to watch when, when we decide to sit down and eat and watch something. She's like, Powerpuff Girls? And it's like Powerpuff Girls are scrubs, right? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to always choose. I love scrubs too, but I love Powerpuff Girls. So I'm like, Powerpuff Girls? Absolutely. Let's watch Powerpuff Girls. And like, she just like, she got them girls down, man. She almost knows the theme song, like that, the opening song now. Like she's like, she's that into the show. Like we did, um, we even got, uh, I like this, <laughs> they were like these little Lego collectible pieces, right? That, that I have that uh, we ended up putting together that are Powerpuff Girls. I was going to leave them in their boxes, not ever, you know, taken out and put together. But she found them and she was like, what? I want to. So we put them together because I was like, okay, sure. Let's do a thing. <laughs> but, but the thing that makes me the happiest is, of course, that her favorite Powerpuff Girl. Also, through no influence of me, I would like to add, happens to be my favorite Powerpuff Girl. So. Which is Bubbles. No. That is not Bubbles. Bubbles is, is <laughs> Bubbles is not my favorite. She's she's probably <laughs> my second favorite. She's also not my daughter's favorite. Uh so by that account. So uh, my favorite Powerpuff girl is, of course, none other than the most awesome Blossom. That was my second guess. So and uh but yes, uh, Blossom is also her favorite through through just her watching the show. She's like, I like Blossom best, and then I like Bubbles, and then I like Buttercup. And then she's like, but sometimes I like Buttercup more than Bubbles, because Bubbles is kind of dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, you're so my child. <laughs> and then we go on to the Great Earth Shake. <laughs> <laughs> so... Back on track with the land before time. <laughs> yes, <And> bubbles. <laughs> so yes, uh, then the tr then this traumatic event happens, and honestly, I gotta say that even in the show, um, the even watching the movie, this scene actually in and of itself, everything that happens in probably the next ten minutes is super traumatic. Um, I don't even know if it's that long, honestly. That whole sequence of events that we're about to start up. So, the, the, the earth shake happens. So, there's this giant kind of earthquake that starts to happen. Um, they're all traveling. 
trying to get to uh, the Great Valley. Making their way there. They sleep weird. Yeah. And this weird, like, frog lizard thing freaks me out. <laughs> and it's like, oh, hey, look at my food. Oh, hey. I didn't quite finish becoming a frog from a tadpole. Oh, and the, the See You Next Tuesday shows up. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you're just not ever going to let her live it down, are you? She has her moments where she's okay. <laughs> I mean, when she forgets like she does here, she's just mm -hmm. playful. And it's not that, like, you know, she doesn't even think about it. She's just like, oh, it's it's something to do. It's, you know, we can play together. Why not? It's fun, it's great. And then the programming kicks back in. We can't have fun together. Right. But it's even more than that because the giant shadow appears. And the sharp tooth shows up. I mean, I would probably be screaming like that too if a giant dinosaur. Right? Right? <laughs> showed up and was like, I've got baby arms for you! <laughs> you know, I feel sad that nobody can see this because the, the video is playing and they're missing all of the, like, T Rex arm motions here. That's how I feel during game night when I'm trying to, like, do the cards on the table. It's like, baby arms, can't <laughs> move the card. <laughs> I like how they use these vines, though, to get away. Yeah. The, like, the they thorn. stay in these, like, thorny vines. Doesn't it, like... Don't they, like, smack it in his snout and he's like... <laughs> trying to get it out. Like, that one right there, you mean? Yeah. And he's like, Ah, oh, damn, my arms are too short! Yeah, I can't reach my face! I can't! I can't get it! And then mom and then... shows up and she's like, I'll beat your ass with my neck and tail. And because of my but, curse, but, my time you know what I like you know what I like about his mom is she's even protecting the three horn who was an asshole to her kid. Right. She's not like she's trying to let anything bad Oh that tail swipe, man. She's not trying to let anything bad happen to Sarah either. But, you know, she pays the price for it in this vicious scene right here where she gets her back ripped open. I think I read that it actually was pretty gruesome. And then they switched it to a shadow. Yeah, because the the producers didn't like it. They thought it would be too scary. Right. Which already, it's pretty fucking scary when you consider everything that's happening, and then this shit happens. And then by the wonder of plate tectonics shit starts to go wrong <laughs> really wrong as they all get separated because the ground starts to split apart the kids are still being chased by fucking the sharp tooth who's like you're a fucking appetizer please let me eat you and then like Gwyneth Paltrow steaming of the JJ. Oh, really? We had to go there? We had to yes, go there. <laughs> I love how they, like, just run along the sharp tooth's back. They're like, yeah, fuck you, T Rex. We got this. But we're gonna, like, run over all the rolling gravel and I'll just get eaten. But by look, you. Mom saves them both. She could have let that little shithead Sarah die. She could. But she didn't. She still tried to do her best to even save her. And like, how much blood has she lost? Since they're not really showing blood on this, by the way. Right? Her whole back has been ripped open. You know she's losing blood like a beast. But I mean, given her size, she's probably not gonna die from that wound. In this time mm -hmm. of the clash of continents... I mean, I'm not saying it's not gonna get infected, but... Families were cut in two. Littlefoot was separated from the, It's really like the fall here that kills her. 
Like, between the wound and the yeah. fall, it's just more than she can, her body can sustain. Sarah! Sarah! Stay away from that long neck, you hear? Hear? Her parents <laughs> were on the other. So, I mean, okay. So this whole scene, like, without the interruption, obviously, of us and our shit talking and whatnot, you know, um... Is is pretty intense uh, with everything that's taking place and happening. Um, the I think this next clip is is just a repeat of this clip partially, so I'm kind of cutting uh, some space here before we get into this next one um, to get to to where the uh, the next portion actually uh, is. Uh, because at this point, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely, Denver Bear Hunter. Everything at this point in the movie is pretty scary, especially if you're a kid, right? The the earth is shaking. There's the camera shake is happening. All of the things that are designed to invoke kind of this visceral response in your body because all of this stuff is happening. And if you're watching this movie in a theater or with a good sound system at home, you have what happening? You have sound lots of sound lots of deep vibrational bass which invokes a fear response to start in your body um so all of these things are sort of happening all at once and now you've got these two little kids well i say kids these two little dinosaurs now completely separated from their families and you end up sort of in this space and you know no one can get to each other you can see this gigantic ass gap here between where they are uh, in proportion to each other. Here is Sarah and Littlefoot down here. This is Sarah's parents, Littlefoot's grandparents all the way up here. And just the sheer size of it is, you know, wow. Like, how, how wide must that gap truly be? I mean, and there's, there's like no way to, without going the long way around or trying to find some kind of chasm going down or up, are you going to be able to cross that? Right. And going down is exactly, uh, what Sarah tries to do. Yeah, it makes me sad, Pixie, that Chomper isn't in this in this movie. Um, I wish Chomper was here because Chomper is is an absolutely joyous little character, even for a sharp tooth. Um, but yes, and speaking of which, this is actually the scene where his mom dies. So sorry if you just joined us, you came in at your one trauma moment. Uh. <laughs> like, yeah. Because she just can't hold on anymore. Chomper is best beast. I, I agree. Do you remember the way to the Great Valley? I guess so. But why do I have to know you're going to be with me? Fuck you, Don Blue. I'm just saying, man. Exactly. This fucking like, hit me. Fuck in the, this hit me in the feels already. <laughs> you fucking asshole. I can't even hear it. <laughs> like fuck you, Don Blues. Dude, this scene makes me cry every time. Like, it's it's all I can do. No shit, guys. It's all I can do to hold back my own tears right now. Like, this scene is really sad. But this though, this. Let's talk about this though, because this is the big thing. And I know we talked about it. If you guys checked us out during the Secret of Nim, we talked about it a little bit then. Um, and obviously we're going to talk about it now because it's kind of a super important thing to touch on. And that is, is that Don Bluth is really good about talking about the hard themes in his movies that nobody seems to want to address with their children. And one of the hardest things to address with kids is, is grief, is death. Right. And I, like I said, in our last, uh, last one with the secret of Nim, um, I actually watched an interview where, Don Bluth was being interviewed about this and the guy went, man, you don't hold any punches when it comes to like the hard stuff like death and afterlife or any of these things. And Don Bluth was like, why? Why do we need to sugarcoat stuff 
because the kids need to know about it. If you shelter them, they're not going to know how to deal with it or they're not going to have the coping skills to deal with it. And then you're going to get some of the things that we have nowadays where people can't cope. Right. Absolutely. They can't self-regulate. They can't self-regulate. They can't cope. No, I 100% agree. And, you know, and one of the things that I really want to touch on, too, with this is that it's really important to understand grief and the process of grief, right? Because it's such a huge part of our lives. Um, None of us get through life without experiencing grief. None of us. It's impossible to get through life without experiencing grief. Um, And... It's so good to have a movie that gives kids the opportunity to experience grief and see grief and watch it kind of run its course uh, in a way that they can relate to. Mm -hmm. And Don Bluth, for as much as we're like, fuck you, Don Bluth, Don Bluth was really good at showing this side of life. Uh, Right. That life is, aw, new kitty's getting stream time. Sush. You want to say hi to the streamers, Sushi? No, I don't want to say hi to the streamers, Mom. New it's kitty sushi. screen time! It's the Sushi Boosh. It's like, okay, leave me alone now. I'm going to go away. He's like, now I'm done. Thanks, bye. Um, you know, but it is it is super important that kids get to experience what this is like. And, yeah, they might not quite take it to the extreme in understanding at this age that we do as adults like we definitely see this and we feel the feels and we we take the heartache and the hurt and kids might not necessarily process it in the same way but what they do see is that something bad happened that it wasn't a good thing that happened and now they see this kid all on its own trying to survive or this this creature all on its own trying to survive and make the best of life and they can hear the hurt and the sadness and they can feel it you know Music is is really good at portraying that, and music hits us as adults really hard, and that's often what makes us cry in movies. It's not actually the emotional context of the scene, believe it or not. It's it's the soundtrack. It's the music Mm -hmm. that evokes the emotional response. Because when when as adults, when you watch a movie, we are able to distance ourselves from what is happening. We can suspend our disbelief or reinstate our belief in what's happening in the scene. We know that the individual didn't really die, right? So why does it invoke such a huge response out of us and cause us to cry? Well, it's it's actually the music that does that to us. Um, correct, Denver Bear Hunter. Um, it's also why, and I'm just going to speed away from Land Before Time for a second, it's also why every time I watch the 10th Doctor regenerate, I fucking cry because... When my doctor dies and he becomes the 11th doctor, I cry every fucking time. It never fails. Never fucking fails. I cry every time. Mm -hmm. Every fucking time. And honestly, when the 11th doctor goes too, I cry. Because Matt Smith's doctor really grew on me. But that's beside the point. So, back to what's at hand. It's really the music that does it to us as adults. Because we are able to suspend and reinstate our belief or our disbelief at any point in time while we're watching a movie. We can flip back and forth. Kids don't really do that. They're either... They're in for a penny and in for a pound. Mm -hmm. So if they have an emotional response, it's not the music causing the emotional response. It's what they're witnessing. They're experiencing that trauma. And when we were kids and we watched these movies, we didn't experience it at the level from the music... We experienced it at the emotional level from what took place. We just saw this kid's mom die, and that made us sad. Right. It's like the same thing with uh, virtual reality with kids. They can't distinguish the the difference between what is reality and what is on the screen until they're about eight or nine years old. So until then, it's like, this is the real thing. Right. Exactly. That, until they gain that suspension of disbelief, it's, it's very very hard for them to distinguish that that moment of real from that moment of fake so even though it might be a cartoon you know and they might know it's not real it's hard for their brains to process it as not real and that's what's Mm -hmm. important to keep in mind that's part of why when we talk about these movies and how they're so traumatizing we as adults are like ah they're not traumatizing (laughs) they fucking are trust me 
they are. You just don't remember. And I know I go over it all the time about why, but you just don't remember because as a kid, it hits you and then it's gone. For a lot of reasons. For a lot, a lot of reasons. But it doesn't make it any less traumatic and it doesn't make it any less important that you experience that trauma because it's important. So, And then when you become an adult, you go, oh yeah, like <laughs> our tax in the swamp. Fuck you, or... our tax. <laughs> move, our tax, please move. <laughs> Come on, our tax. No, no, our tax. Fucking Land Before Time. If you guys missed it, the Land Before Time was our very first TMTTU. That wasn't, no. The Never Ending Story was our oh, first. Oh, yeah, one. the Never Ending Story. Sorry, not the Land Before Time. I got Land Before. I'm. This is what I get for reading while I'm talking. Because <laughs> I'm like, what's my next clip? And I'm reading my next clip while I'm talking, like a genius. Uh, Quick yeah. segue. I had somebody tell me, like, how come you never connected the rock biter? with the dad and the dad's grief and i was like that's an interesting concept that we can revisit at another time but i felt like i needed to say that right now huh yeah you didn't mention that one to me but you know we did talk about how the rec the rock biter was a manifestation of depression mm -hmm. we did we, we did talk about that right at the very beginning of 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 the the movie when the rock biter comes on scene and we talk about how he is sort of this... The nothing is the manifestation of depression as well, but the rockbiter gave it a physical presence. The rockbiter sort of became the the physical connection to depression that the nothing otherwise represented, that emptiness feeling. The rockbiter was the emotional feeling of depression um, because he talks about how he can't you know, hold on to things and he mm -hmm. can't keep things and all of these different things that really add up to him being a manifestation of depression. Right? The nothing right. doesn't teach us anything or tell us anything because it's pure nothing. It's the emptiness that we feel or that's all around us. Uh, where the Correct. rock biter was this thing. I can see the rock biter kind of being an allegorical relation to his dad, but I really thought his dad was broken up into all the other people, like the the little people, like the um, uh, the bat dude. The and, racing snail. And, and the, the racing snail. And that, to me, that's more his dad than the rock biter because I felt like his dad had too many mixed emotions about where he was. But maybe I could take all of them and put them together, and that could also be a conglomerate manifestation of his dad and his mm -hmm. dad's mixed emotions being all over the place. Right. Totally. Um, and man. I like how we were talking about depression, because now Littlefoot is going into depression. I, well, and... Uh, exactly. Exactly. So now we're actually going to get to this part, right, where Littlefoot starts to be depressed um and his depression actually kind of follows him all throughout the movie and i think this is another important thing because it really touches on having recognizing what depression looks like your kid's not a kid's not going to be able to do it right but an adult watching this movie sees it as depression and knows wow man littlefoot's fucking sad that that little teeny tiny dinosaur is depressed as fuck mm-hmm and i don't know like if any of you out there have animals you i mean your animals get depressed. They really they do. do. You might not think about it, but they get depressed. I, I try not to anthropomorphize my animals and put too much emotion on them. But really, you know, when you have animals that act out in different ways, it's because they're displaying emotions in some fashion, mm -hmm. right? Like when my dog, when we put my dog Coda to sleep, I thought Duncan was having, my, my cat Duncan was having a huge reaction just to whatever with his asthma. But really, he was depressed. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't drink water. I had to like go to the vet and get him a ton of fluids. But really, he was depressed. And then we got Prince, and he was better. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I see it all the time in like my cats. Like I see their depression. Mm -hmm. They get super mad and depressed if I leave for too long. Oh, yeah. Like if I go away for a week like I just did and come back. They're super, super depressed. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the, all things that you have to see. And it's good because Littlefoot kind of shows us this. And so we're going to we're gonna take a look at that. And we're going to see a little bit of it um, here with this clip. And this is where Littlefoot also meets Rooter. And Rooter is kind of that old codger wise man. What's going on here? 
what's your problem? You're not hurt. It's not fair. She should have known better. That was a sharp tooth. It's all her fault. All whose fault? Mother's. Oh. I see. I see. Why did I wander so Now the empathy home? comes in. Oh, it's not your fault. It's not your mother's fault. Now, you pay attention, old Rooter. Yeah. But it is nobody's fault. The great circle of life has begun. Hey, Lion King. But you see, not <laughs> all of us arrive at the end. What will I do? I miss her so much. Then you'll always miss her, but she'll always be with you. As but the stars in here don't spell she sex. Taught you. In a way, you'll never be apart. For you are still a part of each other. My tummy hurts. Well, that too will go in time, little fella. Only in time. So I like how Ruder basically tells him, like, yeah, it fucking sucks and it hurts, but it will heal over time. Mm -hmm. And none of us want to hear that when we're feeling that way. And, but no matter how you cut it, it, it it's the truth, right? Right. It sucks and it hurts, but it will heal with time. Yep. It's, um, it's the ball and the button in the box, like we said last time. It's, I forgot which one. <laughs> and now we talked about grief. I mean, well, we talked about grief last time, but I think we also talked about grief in Labyrinth, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, grief is just a trauma we all experience. Grief is a universal trauma, uh, to be honest. Um, it it is the one trauma that is guaranteed to touch all of our lives. Right. Um, there's this really good book called The Grief Handbook that I would suggest anybody get if you're looking to go through grief, because it talks about different ways to process it. Like, looking at a grief timeline, especially with, like, complex grief. Because complex grief is when you're just experiencing different grief on top of each other, and it hasn't been resolved. Well, and complex grief can also arise from your inability to get past and and this isn't a fault of anybody i, I want to make that very clear and it's a pretty normal thing that happens but complex grief can also arise from just not being able to get past the um the 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 event of whatever happened so uh if you're for example i'll, I'll use myself for example i'm not above self-disclosure so when uh when my grandmother died in 2010 I went through complex grief. It took me over two years to really be okay with my grandmother's death. That's complex grief. Mm -hmm. You know, we always try, uh, companies try to put a, a limit, a set of time frame on bereavement, how long it's going to take you to be sad. Um, the sadness has no timeline, folks. I want to point that out first and foremost. Your, your grieving process, it's not three days. Your grieving process can take anywhere from six months to a year. And sometimes some people don't grieve as long and it might take them two or three days and they'll be fine. Uh, and your pets, despite what people might think or secondary uh, trauma grief related to somebody passing that maybe you weren't as close with but that you knew, those things are all relevant grief. They all deserve bereavement time and they all deserve your equal amount of attention in terms of what it takes for you to grieve. I just want to make that very clear because pets are family and family friends are still family friends and friends of friends are still friends and those those things don't change how you feel about when a person dies that can still hit you just as hard or harder sometimes correct and so it's very important to understand that your your grief and the grieving process takes a long time but complex grief complex grief comes when we're unable to really move past uh an event or a thing that happened i was very unable to move past the events that led to my grandmother falling into a coma and then eventually her death, right? It was very hard for me to move past those things. 
the and that is what led to my grief turning into complex grief it, it stopped being regular grief and part of that also is that i was responsible for helping put together all of her funeral arrangements getting everything put together you know i you know there's a lot of things that go into that and i pushed all of that stuff down so i could get all of that stuff out of the way and then once i was allowed to finally grieve it took me a very long time and i played unfortunately the what if game and i tried to bargain a lot um which is a, is a very normal grieving process and unfortunately once someone is dead you can't bargain nothing nothing's gonna come of that we try 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 but nothing is ever gonna come of that um mm -hmm. and, and grief sucks so no matter what anybody tells you grief can take a very long time um and complex grief <laughs> is just just i appreciate that denver bear hunter uh complex grief is just really this very layered systemic kind of repetition of grief where you start this process and it starts off here and then this event happens and you're like oh that was really bad and then this event happens and this event happens and then you start going in circles and it just continues to layer on top of itself until you kind of end up with this here's my core grief and here's all of the layers i've stacked on top of it and hey look i'm split screening again Oh, nope, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> so what? You, you end up with your core here and all of this other complex stuff stacked on top of it. And you have to break all this down to really get through that complex grief. And complex grief can take years to work through. Like any trauma, because that's what it is. Complex grief is just trauma. And, and I say that, and I'm not trying to, to, to denigrate how intense trauma is by any stretch of the imagination. But I want you to recognize that complex grief is trauma. Uh, first and foremost, grief is trauma. Complex grief is very trauma, right? It's That's just what it is. And you have to break those layers down to get back to the core of what was causing the problem so that you can reach some level of acceptance and move forward from that. Um, I mean, trauma is anything that you could don't have the skills to deal with at the time. Correct. Or be able to process at the time. Yes, Pixie. So if, if you don't have the skills to to process failing a test that's a trauma correct if you don't have if you don't have the skills to process a death of a pet that's, that's a trauma. trauma it's not always these huge things that that we think of like wartime or you know assaults uh big natural disasters i mean those are big t traumas right however trauma is just something you can't cope you didn't know how to cope with trauma can come from dropping your phone and having it get broken because it might be your lifeline to most of the world around you. And you don't know how to deal with it being broken because maybe you're in a position at the moment where you can't afford to go get a new phone. That's mm -hmm. trauma. You don't have the skill to deal with it. That's still a trauma. And some people would be like, oh, that's not a traumatic thing. But it is because it's something that just got taken from you and you don't know how to deal with it being taken from you. That's still a trauma. So... Trauma is one of those things, like, it's everywhere. <laughs> and there's, I mean, it's, it's why part of why we do this, right? We love these movies, and we love to talk about these movies. But more than that, we want to talk about and show why it's so important to recognize trauma when you see trauma. Because any of these events are trauma. And let me tell you, we just watched Reuter give that little speech to Littlefoot. And you, that son of a bitch has been through some trauma in his life. Reuter's seen some shit. Reuter been through some shit definitely right like and but i think i think it also shows like the whole movie in this totality shows the resiliency of this ragtag bag of, of this little herd of how they have found their a support system because that's what they did they built their own support system to be resilient against this thing and trudge against all odds to find the great valley yes absolutely and that's what they do and so we're going to kind of get to this this next part, um, this is Littlefoot still kind of wallowing in his grief. Um, but this is the moment where he kind of starts to... He kind of starts to begin his journey out of his grief. Um, mm -hmm. Granted, this journey takes him the rest of the movie. He doesn't really get fully out of his grief until he gets to the Great Valley and he finds his grandparents again and realizes that he's... And, and I want to I want to put it I'm going to put a little bit of emphasis on this because Littlefoot's never been alone in this movie. 
he feels alone because that's his trauma right now. He lost his mom and he feels alone. But he's never alone in this movie, right? He has his friends who are all there helping him and who he's helping along the way. But his grief doesn't end until he finds his grandparents and he's no longer feels alone. And it's not a realization he has until he gets to, to that point. So, um, but this is the moment where Littlefoot begins his journey, in, in my opinion, and maybe Nikki feels a little bit differently about it, but I think this is the moment where Littlefoot starts to begin the first steps of his journey out of his grief. With, with the cherry one? Yeah, this is the flyers. Eh, eh. No, I disagree. I think Ducky is. Ducky is definitely the manifestation of him coming out of that. But this is a moment where he gets some hope. Back. And this is coming for me. With the baby. At first, Littlefoot could only think better. about his mother. He hardly noticed his hunger and forgot about the Great Valley and that he must somehow reach it. I mean, there's a reason why people give food at funerals, especially comfort food, because it's for one, people who are grieving may not think of that bodily function. But That's also, true. If, if it's comfort food, now you're supplying the brain with dopamine. <laughs> <clears throat> that is also true and you get those kind of feel good moments going on and it's super important but see to me that's 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 why this is that moment where he begins to take this journey out of depression because he does have this moment this this little creature who doesn't know him empathizes with him gives him some food and is like come on eat eat something anything <laughs> and i mean Come on, unless you're some kind of weird heathen, cherries are fucking amazing. I think they're amazing. I know some people who don't think they're amazing. Like I said, weird heathens. <laughs> <laughs> we do not judge on this tree. <laughs> they're completely entitled to their absolute wrong opinion, but yet it is wrong. It is. It's wrong. But you know what, though? I'm sure that people feel that way about me when I talk about how vile and disgusting tomatoes are. So. See? I used to eat tomatoes like they were apples, so yeah. <laughs> so did I, when I was a kid, and then I grew up. Are you, <laughs> are you saying I didn't grow up? I mean, I know I didn't grow up, but I definitely grew up and got wise and stopped eating a poisonous plant. Well, that's not true. I still eat potatoes, and they're part of the Nightshade Just family, too. in the Nightshade family doesn't mean it's going to kill <laughs> Tomatoes are a vile, disgusting, viciously poisonous fruit. I don't know what you're talking about. No one should eat that. It's terrible for you. Stop eating them. They're, they're awful. It's like... <laughs> they're delicious. <laughs> I have this argument with my daughter all the time, too. Because, like, if we make tacos, I have to go and buy her tomatoes because she loves tomatoes. And I've always told her, it's like, it's okay. If, if mommy doesn't like a food and you like it, we'll go get it. You can still have it. It's, you know, mommy won't eat it. Ketchup doesn't count. That's not tomatoes. Ketchup is vinegar and sugar. Mixed with tomato paste. Yeah. That doesn't count. And actually, the, the problem isn't, uh, well... It's not texture for me. It's definitely taste. My um, the I can eat things made from tomatoes, but I can't. I can't handle tomatoes. It's 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 a problem with the acid. Tomatoes to me are super super bitter. I don't care how how fucking uh sweet somebody tells me a t tomato is. 
tomatoes to me they'll they're always super bitter they're beyond bitter for me they're they're so beyond bitter for me i can't even like they make me vomit the minute i put one in my mouth i almost instantly vomit i have no, that big no. of a visceral reaction to them there's a reason why i tell people i'm allergic to them note to self <laughs> yeah it's 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 much easier because if they've even touched my food i can taste them it's it's bad like it they can ruin an entire dish for me just if i taste them at all it's 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 terrible but anyways, which I understand is the same thing for some people when it comes to cherries or other types of fruit. But, you know, it's cherries are still the best. I don't, I don't care what somebody says. Cherries are amazing. And then he meets Ducky. So, so anyways, so anyways, we uh, we see this this moment here, you know, we get we get some food, Littlefoot's kind of in his in his funk and and the narrator's right. He forgets about everything. And when you're grieving or you're kind of having this trauma response, that's that's what happens. We tend to shut down. And as we shut down, we forget about all the other things uh, that are happening around us uh, and to us. Uh, and we we're, we're here in our head instead of out here in the world. And that's okay. It's not really a problem it's it's what we all do when we experience some kind of deep trauma or deep grief we get in here the problem the problem becomes when we're in here too much and we we start to neglect everything else right and we're and, not open to other influences exactly so thankfully littlefoot here is open to the influence of being given some food was he though he didn't need it i don't think he ate it but he recognized that he needed to eat um, so, you know, it's just sort of one of those things. Um, and after this, Littlefoot sort of begins to move along his journey again. Um, and this is when Littlefoot meets, uh, meets Ducky. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, yep, yep. So let's, let's, let's meet Ducky. Because I love Ducky. Ducky's amazing. Hello. I hello. said hello. I said hello. What is your name? <gasps> Maybe you cannot talk yet. Huh? Huh? <laughs> I love that. Maybe you cannot don't talk you know yet. Anything. Oh, Long that would be don't sad. talk to or whatever you are. Me? I'm a long neck what too, see? <laughs> and I have a long tail like you. <laughs> oh, Ducky, you're so adorable. All right. I've got a long neck I have and a long, long, long neck. tail. I'm a big mouth, but Just I am all long. alone. I am. I lost my family in the big earth shake. Um, you want to go with me? Yeah. Oh. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I do, I do. My favorite <laughs> toys used to be the All right. puppet Come of on. Ducky that was from Pizza Hut. <clears throat> but you'll have to keep up. I will keep up. I will. I love Ducky. Where are we going? To the Great Valley. I'm not going to stop until I find Ducky's my Ducky's amazing. Like, Ducky's one of those characters that just uh, really... Do you think my family went to the Great Valley, too? Opens huh? you up. Hmm. This, I mean, she's super... My mother said where all the herds were going. Super oh, positive. I hope, I hope, um, I almost hope. to the point of toxic positivity. But my super name's positive. <laughs> Mine is Ducky. But yep, she also suffered loss, yep, and yep, she didn't yep. let it bring her down. <laughs> this is true. De -de 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 -de. And... <laughs> That, that's that, sort of that, contagious to Littlefoot, which that, I think is that, what's important. That, 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 and they're playing. <laughs> yes. Super important. <laughs> Even though he tried to take Sarah's dad's toxicity there for a minute. <laughs> um, and yeah, they start they start playing and they start having this moment together. And Littlefoot kind of realizes that life life can keep going. Right. It didn't have to stop. Um, but, and now that we're talking about Ducky, of course, yup, 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 <laughs> I 
am going to do what therapist Sarah does best. Uh, Trauma. No, we need to have our own segment and theme song that goes traumatizing Sarah moments of the evening. <laughs> Yup, yup, yup. We do. Brought to you by Rule 34. <laughs> you know, you're right. We kind of almost need to have that moment where it's like, what trauma does Sarah bring to us tonight? <laughs> trauma like brought to you by therapist Sarah. So, trauma, trauma. Ha, ha, ha. What trauma does therapist Sarah bring to the table this evening, folks? Well, let's talk about Ducky's voice actor. Ducky's voice actor was amazing. Uh, this was Ducky's voice actor's uh, second to last film. Uh, the last film that Ducky's voice actor did actually was All Dogs Go to Heaven. Uh, and shortly after filming on All Dogs Go to Heaven wrapped up. And uh, this is the moment where I'm going to give you just a little bit of warning, ladies and gentlemen. I am about to throw out a huge trauma bomb. So if you're susceptible to trauma or you don't want to know it, now would be the time to mute me for just a couple of minutes until I give you the okay sign that you can come back. I promise this isn't me playing the game with you. This is literally me saying, it's okay to come back. <laughs> Listen, I recognize the crowd of people we have watching this show, okay? <laughs> Listen, all right, so here it is. Uh, after filming on All Dogs Go to Heaven wrapped up, uh, Don Bluth even said that she was one of his favorite voice actors. He wanted to keep using her for all kinds of films uh, that he had lined up. Uh, she was murdered. Uh, and it wasn't just a murder. She was murdered by her father who killed her, her mother, and uh, was it her sister, her brother, her whole family, and himself. Uh, it was a murder-suicide of the family. Um, and, and, and dad perpetrated it. Um, and and her, her headstone even has her iconic line from Ducky because she always talked about how it was her favorite line to say, which was, yup, yup, yup. Uh, and it is, it is just an utterly heartbreaking thing. Um, and All Dogs Go to Heaven is also on our list of Fuck You Don Bluth movies to talk about. Uh, and so I'm sure that I will bring this a, up again. Did she play the girl in All Dogs Go to Heaven? I believe so. I I'm thinking the voice, you know, because I'm thinking back to when I watched it in the 90s. Yeah. His memory so great. <laughs> yeah. And so it just is, it is just utterly heartbreaking. Um, because she had such a promising career ahead of her. Um, and this, this movie is probably the one that people know her for best. Um, this is the movie that everybody thinks of as being her last movie, but it wasn't, it was actually All Dogs Go to Heaven. Um, and it, it just really, it, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, and Trauma Moments brought to you by Therapist Santa. Um, <laughs> and, and it just is, like... And it makes the trauma of this movie, I think for me, it makes the trauma of this movie even worse uh, right. when I think about it. Because it's just such a poignant thing to know about this character, this upbeat, happy-go-lucky character. Which apparently, according to, I don't remember if that was just the source that I read or if you read it too, she was like that in real life. Like, she just was this really happy-go-lucky kid. Yeah, this, and this her. she loved life. Yeah, she loved life, and 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 this is and this is what happened. Um, and you know it, it's traumatic. And this is the part where I say, if someone you know or yourself is is feeling a certain kind of way, seek out help. <laughs> that's what we're here for. Whether that's the suicide hotline, whether that's just talking to somebody. You know, find someone to to be a confidant, and therapy is a great place to do that because you don't have to worry about it bleeding on other relationships. It's your own special relationship, right? With somebody who is there to listen and not judge, right? And so, you know, on and her dad definitely could have used that. You know, I think he struggled uh, a that... lot with her fame, uh, and his he I believe was alcoholic. Um, and, um, you know, not, not making excuses in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there's never an excuse for that kind of action. Um, but I do believe he struggled a lot with her fame uh, and what that meant for him and his family. You know, she was, his child, wildly more successful than he was at this point in her life. And I can understand and see how that might cause some distress. But, you know, got, 
at the end of the day, other people's success isn't a reflection of you in that sense. Um, it just means that somebody got lucky somewhere. Yeah. She got lucky. This yeah. should have been a thing for, for her parents to celebrate, and her mom apparently did celebrate that success, but dad took that success really hard. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, moving on past this trauma moment. You guys can come back now if you want. Uh, the, um... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's we, all safe now folks you can come back into the water yes there yes. are no sharks <laughs> lurking uh so anyways uh we, as we move up on fast all the fields yes it is it is all the fields uh denver bear hunter i agree um and i'm sure that we will bring this up again when we do all dogs go to heaven but that'll be in a couple of months wait we're not doing it next month no, 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 no. Next month is a different movie. Uh, I'm. It's not our September movie either, because I think I don't. I. It wouldn't be until after the first of the year that we do All Dogs Go to Heaven, because don't we have movies already lined up for August, September, October, November, and December? I know we do for August. October, I know we. Or we're doing two holidays like November and then. In December, we're doing two. Right. And is that, yeah, guys. In case you didn't know, in December you're gonna get two. TMTTUs. Yeah, guys, we're breaking out all the stops in December. <laughs> There's a lot of Christmas trauma movies. So we yes. picked two of our favorites for Christmas trauma. Yeah. Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> all I'm going to say for Christmas movies is don't feed it after midnight. <laughs> 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 and if you don't get that reference then i pity you <laughs> then you're in for a real treat yeah right literally uh so that's a big nope <laughs> <laughs> so you're not gonna show up for one of our christmas ones uh <sighs> so anyways uh <laughs> So anyways, uh, Littlefoot meets Ducky and starts having a normal kind of existence. Granted, during a grief process, and I think this is important to note because I think this is something that people forget about, um, is that during a grieving, during th going through all the stages of grieving, there are moments where you feel like life has gotten back to normal. Mm -hmm. And you have these moments where you are like, oh, everything's good and everything's okay. And Littlefoot goes through this in the movie uh, as well. Because, like, this moment you just saw with him and Ducky, right, where he's playing again and he's laughing. But then we feel guilty because, oh, yeah, we've got this other thing. And then we go right back into our depressive spiral of grief. Yep. And Littlefoot kind of vacillates in and out of this as we go through the movie because other things happen that he has to give his full attention to and he doesn't have time to grieve. And he doesn't have time to be depressed. Right. And he gives his attention to those things, and then he comes back to it. And that's how the grieving process works. And I think, at least in my opinion, and Nikki, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if you don't feel the same way about this, but I feel like that's one of the things that Don Bluth did really well with this movie, is that he shows that grieving isn't this kind of linear, I'm in or out process. It's this process of, I'm, I'm in a grief moment, I'm out of a grief moment, I'm in a grief moment, I'm out of a grief moment, I'm in it, I'm in it, I'm in it, I'm out of it, I'm in it. And you just kind of go back and forth. And that's that's how the the grief process of healing kind of works. You go in okay. and out of it. And what happens is, is that you acclimate to the concept of a new normal. And that new normal is acceptance of the fact that this, this person, this thing, this animal, this event has happened. And you've acclimated to the idea that life continues without it. Mm -hmm. and that's when you reach your new normal and that's when you st you don't i, I want to make this very clear you don't ever stop grieving grief never ends once you start the process of grieving at any point in time in your life that grief will carry you with you forever grieving never ends it's one of the few long-term things that starts and never really finishes because even to this day, 
I can think of a moment in my life that was a grief process and I can go right back into that grieving process. I can fall right back into that, that spiral. Grief is one of the few things that you never, ever, ever, ever actually get away from. It follows you forever. Once it starts, you just acclimate to it and you reach a state of new normal. Yep. It follows you forever. If it feels over, you've reached new normal. Mm -hmm. It's not that you've not really begun grieving. You've grieved. You've just reached new normal. And in and some cases, people will, you know, let's be clear, Pixie, is in some cases, people reach that feeling of, oh, it's over, and then they still have a big grieving process again later. And it's not that you didn't grieve. I, I want to make that very clear. It's not that you didn't grieve. It's that you grieved and, you, and your mind and your body were like, okay, everything's okay. I can cope with this. And then later something happens and your mind and your body went, okay, maybe I'm not as okay with this as I thought I was. And you have another moment where you have to go through that kind of grief cycle again. And so that's okay. But if it feels over, you've, you've grieved and you've, and you've reached your state of new normal. That doesn't mean that it won't come back. If right. I think about like my grandmother too long, even earlier when I was talking about it, I was starting to tear up. Mm-hmm. I have to be careful, right? Because I know that that's a grief process that I will never be out of. Grief is a very tricky, tricky thing. Um, and it, and really, it is the biggest concept that we talk about in The Land Before Time. Um, because grief is what makes this movie. This movie was built around the concept of dealing with grief. And it is so, so imperative to understand. Grief just follows. You just... You just reach new normal, and new normal is you being okay with that loss. You being okay with that loss doesn't mean that that loss is gone or that feeling is gone. It just means you've reached a state of being okay with it, and that's right. why you can fall back into it. You, you, I hate to say this, um, and I might be saying it wrong because now I'm, I'm, I'm probably overthinking it, but you just really don't ever heal grief. Mm -hmm. It's it's not the kind of heal you can do. You know, you, you reach acceptance. Correct. Of it. Like it's happening, and like you were saying, it's what you're saying is the new normal is acceptance. And then again, something else could come along, like you could find something else out new that happened for that particular grieving incident and grief starts again correct because it's new information that you haven't processed correct right you get acclimated to it denver bear hunter yes you get acclimated yes you get acclimated acclimated new normal same same concept you just reach that phase um and, and i just want to make it very clear and it's not something that you should ever beat yourself up over either. Grief is just, it's its normal. Mm -hmm. it, it's 100% normal. It's normal to go in and out of it. It's normal to feel it years later from the time the event happened. Um, Yeah, absolutely, Pixie. That's, you know, that's what we, that's what we're here for. That's why we do this. Um, mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's our, a celebration of these movies and how awesome they are in their own right, but also just the things that they teach us. You know, when we talk about how the movies have traumatized us, but that that it's something that they taught us as well. You know, we never almost get away from any of these movies without talking about something that they taught us about some aspect. And, and they all are very representative of different things that, you know, kind of function out, functionally cause us to feel certain types of ways or cause us to think about things in a certain type of fashion or way. So it's just very important to understand that, you know, it's it's normal it's okay and then from here he meets petrie you, what and so then from here he meets petrie yes from here he meets petrie let's talk about petrie you fly no my stomach is talking <laughs> mine too i love that one mm -hmm. my stomach is talking this <laughs> <looks> like <laughs> <laughs> <gasps> he is talking 
Good boy, is it? <laughs> you should not eat talking trees. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 Who are you? Huh? Well, my name's Petrie. <laughs> Petrie, huh? Funny name. <laughs> Just the anxiety I, I, I that fly? radiates no. off of him. You oh my god, Petrie is nothing I but fall. anxiety. <laughs> he is a ball of anxiety. Fly? But how did you get way up there? I climb. Hmm. But you are a flyer. Not a faller. Odd thing to fly. <laughs> I guess it is. We can't do it. <laughs> nope. We cannot do that, all right. <laughs> I. That's. Okay, so Denver Bear Hunter, let me ask. Why did you identify with Petrie when you were little? He just felt like you. I, I think that's fair. I mean, I identified with Sarah when I was little. Sarah felt like me. That stubborn, bullheaded... What? What? What are you trying to say there? I saw that face. You trying to say I'm gonna see you next Tuesday? Hmm? I was like, were you a see you next Tuesday as a kid? <laughs> I really was. I, I'm not gonna lie. I, re I really was. I, I either identified with Ducky... Or little foot. That's fair. That's fair. I definitely was Sarah. Just stubborn, bullheaded, asshole-ish. Wanted to be in charge of everything. That was definitely me as a kid. My way or the highway. <laughs> yeah. Definitely me as a kid. Definitely me as a kid. So anyways. <laughs> as we all talk about our, our land before time personality type. I don't know if there's a quiz for that. I don't know if there is, but now I'm kind of curious now that we've said it. If See, there's not, we should just make one. <laughs> right. Land before time character quiz. Nope, there is one. There is one. Nice. The Few ideas, Ducky with anxiety. Okay. I mean, that's fair. I think that, that, that Ducky fair. masks their anxiety through their happy-go-lucky... Uh, attitude to be entirely fair so that's perfectly perfectly fine ducky is ducky is scared and afraid because ducky's all alone but ducky covers up that fear with with kind of that joy and silly behavior that's ducky's defense right. mechanism so where petrie's defense mechanism is just a completely manifest his anxiety and wear it you know he's a hundred percent sure he can't fly he can't do this he can't do that he's afraid of his own damn shadow you know, if you look at him wrong, he falls over and dies. You know, Ducky... Sorry. Sorry, Dimmer Bear Hunter. Uh, uh But Petrie really... Petrie really is just anxiety. Petrie, mm -hmm. Petrie is one of the best examples of anxiety I think we've had other than uh, Jeremy <laughs> before the <laughs> Rule 34 incident. Who is also a bird or avian flyer? <laughs> You're right. Who, interestingly enough, what the fuck, Don Bluth, was also a bird. And and he just... Uh, Jeremy had a ton of anxiety. Jeremy in the book was very different, but, you know, we talked about that in... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Well... When, in Rule 34, what? Yes, Piglet uh, is anxiety as well, but uh, there aren't any Winnie the Pooh movies that we would choose to talk about trauma. At least none that I can think of. Christopher Robin schizophrenic well yes if we want to talk about schizophrenia but i would choose christopher robin the newest one uh, oh, i yeah, wouldn't, yeah, yeah. i wouldn't be able to do it though um it's it's just not a movie i would be able to do um and, and in all honesty it's because my mom uh who passed away in 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 2018 was a huge winnie the pooh fan and it was one of the last movies that her and i talked about because she absolutely loved christopher robin because it reminded her so much of the show who did you get I got Ducky! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, link me this quiz. I have to take it now. You are the talkative one in the group. 
You're always you're always in great spirits. People love to be around you and hear what you have to say. I don't know if that's true or not, but yeah, All right, I Link. got done. Uh, if you want you to put can it ID all the major diagnoses in the Winnie the Pooh cast. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely true. That's that's not even a joke. You can. All the Winnie the Pooh characters have some major diagnoses. Uh, so, yes. Wait, is the quiz all of these big pink things? Choose something to eat? Yeah, I was confused by it too, but yeah. I don't know what jewelry has to do with it. Or a sweater has to do with it, but it is. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm while I take this uh, while I take this this quiz, I will let you pick up this next bit talking about Petrie. So yeah, Petrie ball of anxiety. Um, he has this huge inferiority complex of. He really wants to fly, but he knows he can't right now. But he's the one who's holding himself back. He can totally fly. He's got the wings. <laughs> so it's... But with the encouragement of this from his friends, like Ducky and Littlefoot, and, well, Spike doesn't really talk, but <laughs> with the encouragement from them... And the fact that, you know, the chips are down, and what we'll get to there in a minute, um, with the sharp tooth, he finally learns to fly when he forgets about all of his anxiety. When he gets out of his own way. <laughs> with that. I, I don't really like my result, but I can't argue with what it says, so I got little foot which is you may have had a difficult past but it's made you more caring and considerate of others you got little foot we need to put the link in the chat I, i'm going to actually uh that's what i was just about to do um <laughs> if anybody else out there watching the show is curious you can certainly go do the the quiz there it is um I would be curious to see what everybody else gets, since we just announced who we got. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Which, I, I'm curious to see who everybody else gets. Uh, but that being said, so we just met, uh, we just met Petrie. Petrie and his giant anxiety, ball of anxiety, can't, like, has no confidence in himself. Petrie lacks self-confidence. Petrie doesn't even have self-esteem, let's be 100% honest here. He lacks self-confidence right. and self-esteem, and it, he is 100% a ball of anxiety. And he acts like he drank a pot of coffee before he starts talking. <laughs> so what you're saying is that Petrie is Cornholio before Cornholio came about? <laughs> oh, the days when you had to sneak to watch MTV to watch Beavis and Butthead. I know, right? My grandmother used to get so mad at me for watching Beavis and Butthead. Uh, <laughs> damn it, Beavis. Stop watching my, the TV. My cousin, my older cousin, was like, "Don't tell your mom that I showed you this." <laughs> he got us watching View with the Butthead. <laughs> you no, know, I don't care. Beavis and Butthead was great back in the day. Yeah, it really was. The show was so like you just like you looked at it and you're like, "God, that is every stupid teenager I know." Right. And that's where, like, King of the Hill got its start. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, they meet Petrie. Um, but then, uh, right after we meet Petrie, we've had this kind of happy-go-lucky thing going on with Ducky. Uh, we get, uh, Sarah coming back into the scene. And she's been absent for a while. Because, you know, she had to go off and do it all on her own. This is where she does the, the sharp tooth thing. Yeah. It's you! What happened? I'm taking a wave. Why are you so frightened? Frightened? Me? <laughs> Why are you so frightened? We're not frightened. 
are we? Nope. nope. Well, you should be. Can we mask our fear with I arrogance? Mm-hmm. But I chose to come back to warn you. I met the sharp tooth. This is what the start of narcissism. Oh, Sarah's 100% a narcissist. Sharp is dead. He fell down into the big underground. And I think she's a vulnerable narcissist. Me. Oh, I am a malignant one. Brave I would agree with that. Dear brave Sarah. Yes, I am brave. Sharp and she learns. She just doesn't really have empathy for all the other characters. <laughs> you know, she does later in the later shows. But yes, in the dark. beginning, definitely not. She has no empathy for anyone. I can mm -hmm. hear him breathing. <sighs> I could see his one big ugly eye looking for me. <gasps> what did you do? Huh? Huh? <laughs> Denver Bear Hunter got Sarah. <laughs> In the eye. Feisty and a bit mischievous, I but you have a heart dead. of gold. <laughs> so Sarah comes back, introduces us to the fact that the sharp tooth is still around, and now we find an egg? What? It's time Hello? for you to come out. Why have you not hatched yet? Oh, there you, you should come out. You should. You are late. Yes, you are. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. You need to come out. Come out. You are all alone. Are you not scared? Huh? I've totally done that. <laughs> And all the kids at Ridge Creek are like, no! Spike is just like, so I don't get it. Like, Spike is huge compared to what that egg was. He spontaneously grew as he came out of that egg. No, man, it's like those packages you get and they're vacuum sealed. As and then you, you cut them open, open and everything's and it like. Goes, <laughs> it's like my bed when it came in is like this little box, and now it's like taking up half my fucking room. Five hundred dinosaurs set off for the Great Valley. There had never been such a herd before. Along. Ah, I like how the narrator points out at this point that there had never been a herd like this before. Yes. Because this is a the herd made egg. up of single species, and they all have to work together. To accomplish their task. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a long neck, a three horn. <laughs> yeah, a long neck, a three horn, a big mouth, a flyer who can't fly, and, and a, a spike, spike tail, tail who's just lazy and wants to eat. Who's just the? I, I don't know. I think he would be like I, I wouldn't say like the butt monkey, but no, that's Petrie. Yeah, I don't know what he would be. He, you know, Spike reminds me of like stoners. He eats his feelings? No, he doesn't eat his feelings, though. Spike is no, just really chill. Spike isn't a... Ah, that's what it is. Spike isn't affected by a lot. You know You know what? Uh, it's, it's almost like Spike is on the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Now that I really think about it. That's almost like Spike is on the spectrum. I could see that. I can move my stoner theory aside and <laughs> say, like, what kind of weed's he eating? But, I mean, I could be wrong, but, but it just seems like maybe that fits in the best. I don't know. I, I could be yeah. wrong. I would have to really, really think about where Spike fits in. But, you know, I would also, I would also have to base that judgment on all of Spike's other interactions later on in the other series. Mm -hmm. I would have to really look at that from a kind of a hard perspective. Nonverbal spike. He, yeah, 
He he really is pretty un, pretty nonverbal. Uh, so we get Spike. Um, and you know Spike kind of is a really easy introduction. There's not much to him other than you know Ducky doing the whole like, "Come out, come out, you're late." Don't be alone. Come with us. We're going to the Great Valley. He eats some food and they start their march back towards the Great Valley. I mean... And then we have the the, the, the sleep scene after that. Yeah. Where it's like Sarah and Littlefoot have a tiff about who's in charge. Correct. Pretty bad. Look at that cranky face. Fuck you, I'll sleep by myself then. I still don't understand this tree star business. It's... Well, I like how everybody starts off sleeping with Sarah. And poor Littlefoot is like, Oh, I had a tribe and now my tribe is abandoning me again. And you see him spiraling right back into his grief. Mm -hmm. Right back into his grief is where he's going right now. Because all he's thinking about, oh, hi, cat, is. is... Oh, your cat! <laughs> all he's thinking about right now is how his mom left him. And now his friends have abandoned him, too. This is how, tr this is how abandonment issues get started. Correct. And I, I don't know about this snoring thing, though. All, I'm like, yes, Ducky, no. The snoring gotta go. Yeah, but why bury yourself under one of the noisemakers? This is gonna be loud. I never said she was completely intelligent. <laughs> Ducky's like, fuck this, I'm going to Littlefoot. Screw you guys. Littlefoot doesn't snore. I'm with you, Pixie. I'm totally ducky. I'm gonna go over here. You're not snoring. You've got some. You've got some warm skin flaps. I'm gonna snuggle under you. Look at that. Instantly made to feel better. And then here comes Petrie. They're all like sleepwalking. <laughs> I don't know about his claws and my nose though. That would that would kind of upset. Right. Me. But I love how Sarah's like instantly cold. She's like, well, what? Duh. Where the fuck did everybody go? I'm out here in the cold all alone again? Son of a bitch. Spike's not a small dinosaur. <laughs> Aw, poor Sarah. Time to swallow your pride there, honey. Spike's just looking at her with the one eye open. But I love how everybody just ultimately cuddles up. Well, they they accept her. They know her flaws. They know she can be pig-headed and yeah. let's see you next Tuesday sometimes. But they still accept her as a human being and where she's at. As as my cat. And the sharp tooth footprint. Yes, the foreshadowing of the sharp tooth footprint. Yes, yes. The that that that's that's I, the one thing I th was like, how did they not notice they were stand like sleeping in a sharp tooth footprint? After being stomped on practically by a sharp tooth, you think they would be much more aware of that? Of what they look like. But I also love like how Littlefoot totally blamed the sharp tooth. He's like, it's her fault. <laughs> then he blamed his mom. It's also her fault for getting all caught up in the battle. You know, trying to defend him and Sarah and not let them die. Well, that's the whole anger thing, you know? Yep. Blame deflects from our feelings and our part and stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, so, if we're going to get really serious about it, Littlefoot, you went off and played with, with Sarah, and you pissed off the sharp tooth and brought him to your mom. So if we're going to get real serious about it... Yeah. The only people at fault here, Littlefoot. <clears throat> right. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting thought to take it as a reference to the sharp tooth that killed his mom, and now that he has a family again, that's absolutely true. But it's also foreshadowing that the sharp tooth isn't actually dead. 
and that it's something that they still have to deal with, right? This is the the kind of the running theme of this trauma in the movie has been that Littlefoot hasn't dealt with his grief yet. For him to fully deal with his grief in this sense, he has to face what's happened. For him to do that, he has to face the sharp tooth. When when we accept grief, that's exactly what we're doing. Our when we reach the stage of acceptance, we're facing the fact that it's the thing that's happened. Littlefoot hasn't faced the fact that the sharp tooth and his mom battled, right? He's still angry about what happened and he hasn't fully accepted that this is just the way it works. Ruder tried to explain that to him, right? That in time you'll learn to accept these things as for what they are. This is how life works. It's not the sharp tooth's fault. It's not your mom's fault. This is how life works. But Littlefoot yep. can't accept that yet, and he doesn't really accept that until he confronts the sharp tooth again. Is it, doesn't he say it's not fair? Yes. Because remember, I, I can't hear. What, yeah, what's, he what's does go on about how it's not fair. And that's the other thing, you know, and it's something I try to teach my kid, and I think it's an important lesson to teach other people. And, I, I, you know, I worked with, uh, at one time I worked with patients that had brain injuries, and one of the big things that they like to always fall back on is, well, that's not fair. And the big thing that I always had to remind my brain injury patients, and it's what I also remind my child, is that life isn't fair. There's no such thing as, as fair. Fair is a concept that we have devised to help with equality. But there's no such thing as fair. It's, it's never fair. If it, was, if it was fair, we wouldn't have to fight for things. Mm-hmm. If it was fair, nobody, you know, we, we would all be able to get front row seats. If it was fair, right, we wouldn't worry about the way the world is functioning and how it will impact our individual lives at different points and times. Right. We, we have this misconstrued concept in life that things have to be fair. But life isn't fair. It will never be fair. And I'm sorry <laughs> that that's a hard truth. But it's it's one that I have to constantly remind myself of, too. Life's not fair. Yep, it's you, not. You can work hard and you can do all the right things and never get ahead. And the person who sits on their ass, you know, all day long with their thumb up their butt can win the lottery and have everything. Mm-hmm. Right? Life's, life's not fair. It's just life. And we have to learn to take it and deal with it. And that's part of what Littlefoot is learning on this. And I'm split screening again. Part of what Littlefoot is learning on this journey is that life isn't fair. Welcome back. Yeah, life's not fair. <laughs> I'm like sitting there talking and I'm like, suddenly I was like, I'm split screening again. Ah! I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on. It's got to be the internet connection or something because I have changed so many things and it still does this bullshit. That's fine. It's whatever. So uh, we go from that, the sleep scene, and then they find they've been without food. This is the part we've skipped over. <laughs> they've been without food for some time now. These, these, what, that, five of them? Yeah, five infant dinosaurs. <laughs> Who, by the way, are all herbivores. Mm -hmm. the, well, the except for Petrie. Well, Petrie's an yeah. omnivore. Right. And even then, I would gander to say that Petrie's actually probably really pescatarian. But yeah. that's that's being a little specific. <laughs> we have five baby dinosaurs. Who have not eaten in quite some time. Listen, I'm not saying it was aliens, but. <laughs> aliens. <laughs> All right, folks, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I don't know if we have the clip of them, like, trying to get food. I think we do, actually, because I've got this one right here. Petrie, do you think you could uh, fly up there? No, and... no. Petrie, do not feel sad. 
It is all this right. isn't the big, the big fly. grove. Rock. Oh, this sweet, was after chick, the big grove had been de decimated by long necks. Right. This is all that's left. This is when Petrie learns to fly, <laughs> isn't it? No. No. All. <laughs> But they work together, like they have this teamwork happening. Spike's like, like, let me give you a little. Okay, hey, not too fast. Hey, not too fast. And up we go. Hey, just think, little foot. One day, this will be the, the distance of your head to the ground. And then like, Peter has four not phones. even, so not even ridiculous. like your whole neck, just your face. <laughs> oh, acrophobia. I'm sorry, not agoraphobia. <laughs> the oddly disappearing, reappearing three star. Well, he hasn't lost it for good. No, wait. Yes, he has lost it for good now. And by this point in the movie, he's lost the three star for good. He left it behind. Yeah, with the sharp tooth, I think. Ducky, Petrie, come uh -huh. down here. We've got green food. Yeah, well, we didn't show the, the hole. What? No, we didn't. But he lost it right there at the sharp tooth. Uh, foot. That's where he right. left it. And I don't think Big Mouth eat two stars. Or if he can eat, like, sea grass. Come on, yeah, but Sarah. that's still We've got green food. still gonna be a chlorophyll based I can get food, my so it's still gonna food. give the nutrition that they need. Oh yeah, and this is where Sarah's like, I'm gonna get my own tree stuff. I can do it myself. Me 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 me. And little foot's like. Now, have you ever noticed that all the mean characters are always Sarah's? I love how Littlefoot tricks her right here. It's yeah. one of my favorite things. Littlefoot's like, ha ha ha, you think that you got it on your own, but really I just dropped a mouthful of shit on you. Enjoy, right. bitch. Enjoy. <laughs> okay, so I do want to point that out, Pixie. You're absolutely right. Sarah is almost everybody's introduction to a mean character. And have you ever noticed that it's always a Sarah who's just a fucking bitch? In movies? Have you ever noticed that? I've never met a bitchy Sarah in my life. I mean, except for me when I was a kid, but. Even the Sarah I knew when I was a kid wasn't as bitchy as me. Well, my cousin Sarah was not bitchy. She was actually pretty cool. And then... I don't, I don't know. Heathers are kind of bitchy. Regina's. <laughs> Jennifer's. Jennifers Jennifer. are a bunch of see you next Tuesdays. Sorry if there's any Jennifers on the stream. <laughs> Dude, we, could, we could just go classic and go Karen. But... Listen, nobody likes a Karen, okay? <laughs> nobody One of my best friends' name Karen. is Karen, and she doesn't act like Karen. I never met any. I have never met a single Karen in my life. I'm really trying hard to think here. Yeah, one of my best friends' name is Karen. I don't think I ever had any friends named Karen. I don't think I ever met a Karen. I don't think any of my friends' moms were named Karen. I've known Ashley's and Lauren's who were all great people, and I've known Lauren's who were assholes, uh, and Nicole's. I've only ever known asshole Nicole's. But then one of the asshole Nicole's I knew, when she grew up, she became a much better person. I don't know, names are weird, right? Like, how they get associated with, like... Mm -hmm. Listen, leave my middle name out of this Denver Bear Hunter. So, Sarah and Michelle? <laughs> Listen! <laughs> What's that? Okay, what do you guys got against Michelle's? I, I only... Okay, I knew a Michelle, but she wasn't a bad person. She was just stuck up. But she didn't treat people badly. She just was... I don't know how to explain that. She was just stuck up. Uh, yeah, she was a snob. But, like, she was nice to people. 
I I've never met I never met a mean Michelle. I I don't know I don't know names are weird. Names are weird. That's all I gotta say. Names are weird. Names are weird in how we imbue them with certain meanings. Like, I'm sorry, Karen is a name that has forever ruined thanks to the internet. <laughs> yeah. And, I don't know how that and started. And the fact, and the, well, it got started because some fucking lady named Karen was throwing a fit. And now every time you turn around, it's a goddamn Karen that's throwing a fit. <laughs> and they're always actually Karens. Their, their name is Karen. <laughs> Damn. Oh, oh, okay. The first, the two first names trend as a giggle, like James Scott Smith. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, whatevs. So, anyways, they get some food. They work together to get food. They try to make Sarah feel better and, like, she's capable of doing something because she's just trying so hard by bashing her head against that tree. You know, we all do that. We all bash our head into a wall trying to get something done sometimes, right? What are you playing with? It's driving me nuts. What? What are you playing with? It's driving me nuts. It's a little stingy toy. Yeah, yeah. It's a little stingy toy. Yeah, it drives my cats crazy. Uh-huh, so yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, that's exactly what I see. And then you have the thuddy. <laughs> wow. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to remind you that this is a mature stream. Run by two people who have ADD. Who are both sex therapists. Right. And who are both trauma informed. <laughs> and who are both geek therapists. We can keep going. <laughs> Anyways. No, no, we won't, because it's 11 o'clock. Anyways. Uh, so, well, you know, actually, there's a lot to unpack for this movie. I did not realize when we watched the movie, I didn't feel like we had that much to unpack. But now that we're talking about the movie, I'm like, damn, there's a lot to unpack with this movie. Right. There's just so much shit to unpack with this movie. I'm like, damn, when did this happen? And then they go to, like, the lava thing. Yeah, so they get some green food, they finally get some food in their tummies, and then this shit happens. dying in a tar pit. But Littlefoot, Petrie, Spike, Ducky, help! Not where does she fucking say Littlefoot's name? I know where you 
still too proud to admit that she'd gone the wrong way. But Sarah's embarrassed. No, poor Sarah. Poor Sarah. And because so she's embarrassed, she has to go lick her wounds and self-soothe before she comes back. She does. She like does. most vulnerable nurses. Yes. Yes. Poor Sarah. Poor Sarah. I feel bad for her. I'm mocking her, aren't I? I can't help it. She's such a see you next Tuesday. I hate to say this, but she kind of deserved that. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what we call just desserts, folks. She got some comeuppance there. Little karma. Little karma. You can't be an asshole forever. Especially when I mean, you keep man. treating your friends like shit. Especially the one who keeps saving everybody, like Littlefoot. Not that I really ever want to picture Littlefoot as like having this weird savior complex, but he really does kind of mm -hmm. have a savior complex going on. But that's a story for another time. So yeah. in the later movies, he's definitely had the savior complex. Yes, yes. So uh, the the next bit. I don't I don't know this question. What is S Y N T? What's the S Y N T in reference uh, to? Oh, is that see you next Tuesday? Oh, it's yes, yes. <laughs> See you next Tuesday is cunt. Yeah. See? Uh, see you See next you. Tuesday. <laughs> I guess I could have written that out. See you next Tuesday. There we go. Yes. How did yes. I... I guess I didn't get flagged because I put spaces between every letter. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure that... Our, our bot would have flagged me and been like, no, you can't say that. <laughs> the moderator has to approve. I approve. So I'm surprised I haven't had to approve anything tonight. Honest to God, I really am. Usually I have to approve at least one thing a night when we do this. Just saying. Just saying. So uh, all of this happens. Sarah goes to lick her wounds. She's feeling a little babyish because of how she's acted. And yet everybody keeps still coming back to save her. Uh, and she's finally starting... You're absolutely welcome, Pixie. Uh, she's finally starting to feel uh, like she belongs to the group, but she doesn't know how to process that. Time out? I'll be right back. You keep talking. Okay, I'll keep talking. Bye! Uh, so... <laughs> wow, ladies and gentlemen, apparently I'm the only one left. <laughs> Alright, no. So anyways. Uh, so... Wow. It's just weird now when it's all by when it's when it's all me. Yeah, we're all in trouble now. So let's talk about player agency. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we won't talk about player agency. I was I was gonna bring up some D and D stuff, but we don't need to do that. I was actually talking about that earlier tonight, just before we got started with this whole thing about how my uh, my players have way too much agency, and I don't do enough to take it away from them. And maybe I should do more, but I like their agency because it, it gives them something to do. Uh, so, anyways. Uh, as one of my players is here watching the stream, if not more than one of them right now, listening to me talk about taking away their agency a little bit. Uh, so anyways, uh, Littlefoot rescues everybody. Well, he doesn't rescue everybody by himself, but they work together to rescue each other. And the next thing that happens is, you know, Petrie has to come out of his shell a little bit. Everything all right there? Yeah, I had to get food. Oh. I wrote it in the thing. <laughs> did you did you write it in Discord? Yes. Oh well, that's why I didn't see it. That's not my fault. I did not realize that you. That's why I got my food before delivered before we streamed and I ate. I didn't think I was gonna be hungry and I am, so I ordered food. I'm okay. taking care of my needs. <laughs> 
Meet your needs. Me meeting your needs is important. Let's talk about that for a second, uh, because that was one of the things that Littlefoot wasn't doing earlier in the show, was meeting his needs. You gotta meet your needs. Meet your needs. Needs are important. If you're not meeting your basic needs, then it's really hard for you to move forward with anything. Ever. Period. Okay, so anyways. Self-care. Yes. I'm a huge proponent of self-care. I love it. Self-care is something I do all the time. Don't be afraid to take a day off work just to do a little self-care. You all deserve it. There should be more self-care days. I'm still a huge proponent of a four-day work week. One of the yep. one of the countries, what was that? Was it Sweden? Yeah, Sweden or Norway. One of them just did a, a huge experiment on a four-day work week and found out how much a four-day work week improved people's lives. Too bad mm -hmm. the United States will never adopt it because anything that improves people's lives in the United States is commie fuckery. <laughs> but anyways, not to get political. So, uh, let's talk about the scary shit that happens next. Uh, is this the battle with the sharp tooth? Yeah, because that sharp tooth, man, that bitch is still alive and kicking. And Littlefoot's finally got to face his reality. Okay, he's going to drown. <laughs> I like how they use duck meat as bait. Huh? They use duck meat as bait. Yeah. I love how brave Petrie gets, and then Petrie's like, oh shit! Oh damn! This is where Petrie learns. Yes. Look at me! I'm here! Look at, look at Petrie go! He got all brave now! I just... I go! Right into the eyeball. It's like dark. Oh, and he's pulling the eyelashes up. Yeah. Here comes Sarah. Sarah the finally saving her friends. Ah! Petrie! No, oh, he put his tail! I feel bad for that sharp tooth. They just drowned it. Yeah, he got drowned. That's a that's a harsh way for her to go. Drowning? But isn't that like the same sharp tooth that's been chasing them the entire yeah, time? Yeah, she's been chasing them the whole movie. But drowning? Even though, you know, Come on. You know, sharp tooth's gotta eat. <laughs> poor, poor Petrie. Aww, sad ducky. Poor Petrie. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> you go without Petrie? Petrie. Happy Ducky. Petrie, Ducky Ducky's dead. emotions are so like all over the place. I don't even know how to deal with Ducky's emotions. Ducky's like, I'm sad. No, I'm happy. I'm sad. No, I'm happy. She's she's a cancer. She got mood swings. Ducky oh. Ducky's got some serious mood swings. That girl's either on or off. Like she's not there's no in between. She does not have a fucking slider switch that allows her to dim her emotions. She is 100% plus or minus, on or off, one or zero, ain't no fucking in between. That girl, that girl got some issues. <laughs> oh, Ducky, now I'm sad again. Alright, so anyways, now, moving on. So, Right after they kill the sharp tooth, somebody looks up from the rocks <laughs> and basically notices what? Everybody! They notice this. Oh, I forgot we were gonna Mother! do. I forgot about this moment where we do another Lion King thing. Oh yeah. Littlefoot. Littlefoot. Mother. 
Simba. I, I tried Simba. to do what you told me. Don't go, Mother. But it's just too hard. I'll never find the great Littlefoot's valley. having a little bit of a dissociative episode right now. Mother. Mother. Well, he just, Don't you know, go, kind mother. of resolved Don't go. grief. And... Well, he had to face his trauma. Mm -hmm. And this is the rest of it. It's yeah. Gone. Let me run through this cave following this weird cloud. This effervescent spirit into... Dun, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. I love, oh, Kevin. I love how we get the mystical light beam that opens up. It totally, you know what this totally reminds me of? I gotta pause for a second, guys. I'm sorry. We're gonna cut back. This totally reminds me of that scene in Luc Besson's Jean of Arc where uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman is playing God and he's like, of all the millions of possibilities that you could have chosen to explain this sword, you chose... <laughs> it's a fucking light beam from God. <laughs> like, I'm like, every time, every time I see this, it reminds me of that. And I just can hear Dustin Hoffman's voice in my head every time going, of all the millions of possibilities, you chose this one. <laughs> And yes, Pixie, you are right. The light opens up and comes out right where her heart would be. The clouds also form like three or four different long necks. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if one of them's his dad. The absentee dad. Listen, Don Bluth, just like Disney, isn't above killing parents. Just not happy. Hey guys, look, it's the Great Valley. It's a verdant green landscape of life. And look at that odd shape that it has. It's great valley. Sarah, find Ducky Petrie over here! We found him! Oh, ho, ho. Littlefoot, you found it! I love how triumphant the music is. We did it! We did it together! And sharp stone hills on either side. <laughs> right, it's like a mouse. I mean, vagina dentata? You mean teeth? Oh, God. That movie, <laughs> you gotta love teeth. That movie is crazy, man. That is, you know, we should do that movie. How old is teeth? Oh, my God. You know, I, that's a really good question. Uh, and I've think... actually never seen teeth. I've just heard of it by reputation. Wait, you... 2007. You've never actually seen it? Oh my god, you should so watch it. It's hilarious. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. It's fucking... At first, like, somebody explained it to me like it was a documentary, and I'm like, I'm not gonna watch a documentary about this. And then someone's like, no, it's a horror movie that's like a comedy. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe one day I I'll watch this. I, like, I just don't understand, like, I don't have, if you haven't watched Teeth, you should definitely watch Teeth. It's so messed up. <laughs> it's, right. it's really not I don't know, like it's a it's a it's a it really it's a movie about trauma. Mm hmm it, it is. That's why I'm saying we should do it. That's that I wasn't actually joking when I said we should do it. We we won't do it anytime no. soon. Huh? I didn't think you were joking. Yeah, no no no. Um but it, it's definitely, it, it's, it, it's a movie about trauma. Uh, so, you know, uh, as usual, we, we reach the, we reach the end. And of course, I'm going to do my usual spiel that I do when we reach the end of movies like this. Because what happens? We erase all the trauma. Sort of. Mm -hmm. Not as much with Land Before Time as we do with other movies. Because there's still this great big trauma scene that happens right before the end. Because you have right. all this this big, nasty, gnarly fight with the sharp tooth and the sharp tooth dying. And we thought we lost Petrie, but Petrie was alive. But we have the same kind of ending that we usually get when we watch these movies about trauma. There's this big, happy ending right at the very end that sort of erases all of the bad shit that happened along the way. Mm -hmm. And it leaves you with this feeling of, of hope and this kind of effervescent feeling of like, everything's going to be okay. And, and that's what we yeah, wanted to yeah. do, of course. But... The reality is, is that the trauma is still there. 
Just because there's a big fucking happy ending doesn't mean Littlefoot didn't lose his mom, didn't mean that they were in life or death situations, doesn't mean that they don't have some form of fucking PTSD from all that shit. Uh, you know, facts are facts. They, they <laughs> still went through trauma. It doesn't just go away. But these happy endings are why we forget as we age that we watched a movie that was riddled with trauma. Mm -hmm. that's why when we look back on them we have these fond memories about oh it's a dinosaur on a journey to find you know the the great valley after he loses his mom and he makes makes some friends along the way before he finds the place mm -hmm. we remember the key components but what we don't remember is all the trauma in the middle all of the bad shit that happened for us to have just that little bit of synoptic memory that says this is what the land before time is about Dinosaur, mm -hmm. loses mom, makes some friends along the way, finds Great Valley, life's good. We don't we don't remember the rest of it. Because we conveniently sort of forget about it. And the human brain is really good about conveniently forgetting good things and remembering bad things. But when it comes to weird trauma movies like this, we always tend to remember that happy ending. We don't and remember the bad that shit that happened in the middle because it didn't happen to us. Because we don't want to have the feels of that sucks when we leave the movie theater. Right? You know, in my whole my whole life, I have only ever walked out of one movie ever that I paid for. Only one. I don't walk out of any. I'll let you guess. If you can guess which movie I walked out of, and it was with my mom, which says something even more because my mom and I went to a movie, but... The fact that my mom and I both agreed to walk out of this movie. I have no idea. And the funny thing is, is that we were both, uh, we're both, her more so than I, but even I, fans of this writer who is a prolific horror writer who wrote the book that this movie was based on. That's your hint. I just gave it to you. But it was so bad. In fact, one of my cats looks like the cat from that movie. Oh, Pet Cemetery? We you walked out like of Pet Cemetery because it was so bad. Katya looks just like Church. Man, Pet Cemetery terrified me. That movie was so bad. My mom and I walked out. I haven't seen the remake yet. I haven't seen the remake, but the original one. With the sister was the more, most traumatic traumatic part of Pet Cemetery. We should add Pet Cemetery to our list. That's another good yeah. trauma movie. Well, I mean, we've been trying to stay away from R-rated trauma movies, but we're going to eventually get to them. I mean, because it wasn't, you know, the cat getting reanimated, or the boy getting reanimated, or the umpteen million other things Stephen King put in there. It was the fact that this woman had to take care of her sister, who had a severe eating disorder. And it wasn't even the eating disorder. It's how they portrayed the sister. <laughs> Night, Pixie. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. So, you know, as always, guys, this this is how these trauma movies end, right? These, these trauma movies for kids, this is how they end. Or these trauma movies for young adults, this is how they end. They always have that happy ending that kind of erases the trauma that happens to all of us. And it kind of moves on with itself. But, as always... We don't want to forget the trauma was there. That's why we remember these movies. Honestly, it's, we don't remember them because of the happy ending. We actually remember them because of the trauma. We just don't remember the trauma. Mm -hmm. There's a reason the movie sticks with us. The brain is good at that. And I think, as always, this movie again. Ah, uh, you know what you did not send me? You did not send me my ratings number. Sorry. I just realized that. You know, I asked for them all last week, remember, or a month ago. And you're like, ah, we'll just make them when we need them. <laughs> right. Well, I had extenuating circumstances. You did. I'm just giving you shit. So, anyways, um, all in all, guys, uh, I don't have my scale. I'm going to pop it up there really quickly. You can see it. I don't have my number for my scale tonight. But I'm going to tell you that I give The Land Before Time a solid six on our trauma scale. Would agree. A six. Between all of the things that happen, we're talking about 
the fight scenes, the death, the violence, the constant reminders of depression and just that lingering sense of anxiety that kind of follows Littlefoot throughout the film. Like, this, this movie rates a solid six on my trauma scale. Yeah. And... And it really is such a timeless movie. The animation is fantastic. And again, as much as we say fuck you, Don Bluth, on all of this, um, I, I gotta say, he is amazing. He is. He's a he's a great animator. Um, he had the courage to go against Disney and start his own company and challenge these really hard topics that Disney did not want to challenge at the time. Right. And I think it was super important. And you know guys, and I and I want to point out that this is after Disney's dark era. Mhm. People forget about the dark era of Disney where you had things like The Black Cauldron and Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty. Those are not Cinderella, but Sleeping Beauty and The Black Cauldron and and to some extent even Snow White. Um but mm -hmm. by the time you get to Cinderella, we're kind of moving away from the dark era of Disney. Yeah, and or, or washing it, or like magic washing it. Every, there, right? We start magic know. washing everything away, and we get away from the darker aspects of what was going on. And it's kind of a shame because, well, a Disney's fairy tales are all based on really dark tales to begin with, uh, that they've yeah. turned into these happy-go-lucky bullshit stories. But we won't even get into that. But the point is, is that Disney at one time wasn't afraid to be dark. Mm -hmm. At one time, Disney wasn't afraid to do real topics and real stories but somewhere along the way they turned it into whitewashed happy princess bullshit and don't get me wrong i enjoy that to some extent but yeah and I, I think now they're getting away from that though too. they are they're starting to move away from that and back towards these darker heavier topics you know like, they uh, brian the last dragon all about trust yes that was great i even frozen too honestly um they tackled the, the, they tackled grief a little bit in Frozen 2. They didn't do it super well. And I, and I only bring that up because I just rewatched it again with my daughter because she loves Frozen. So, you know, but but yeah. Raya and the Last Dragon is a perfect example. They tackle trust and the hardships and how hard it is to earn trust, how trust is lost, and how difficult it is to get trust back. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so they really started tackling some heavier topics um, in their recent films, and that's good. It's glad to see them go back to that. Um they really do, Denver Bear Hunter. You're right. They do. Uh, but Disney's basic animation studio is getting back into that stuff, too. Like, just their normal animation stuff, um, if, if we want to be honest. But that's that's another topic for another time. You know, at the end of the day, the important thing to remember is that this is a great film. Everybody mm -hmm. should watch this film. If you have kids, your kids should watch this film. Nobody should be exempt from watching The Land Before Time. It's It's timeless. And it has such good lessons to teach us. Despite all of its little trauma moments, it has really good lessons to teach all of us. And yeah, I, for one... It aged really well. It has aged well. Of, 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 you know, of all the animated films we've watched, this has aged better than some of them. It definitely aged better than The Last Unicorn. Yeah, even though it's a I mean, I didn't even say that Last Unicorn... Like, the animation <laughs> in The Last Unicorn aged well, but the overall film did not. Yeah. The, the, Jeff Bridges should not be singing. No. Jeff Bridges does not need <laughs> to sing ever. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. Neither does the woman who played uh, uh, oh, Amalfia. Amalfia. Uh, oh, man. I can't remember her name now. Uh, Mina something? No. Was it Mia, um, man, <sighs> whatever. She sucked at singing in that movie. <laughs> that was Mia like Farrow. one of the real Mia problems Farrow. of that movie. Mia Farrow. Yeah. yeah. Her and Jeff Bridges singing was some of the real trauma in that movie. That, that shit was straight up terrifying. Not, no. not even gonna lie. Straight that, up like, terrifying that shit was. No. <laughs> That, that shit was straight up terrifying. Uh, but that being said, guys, as always, it is a pleasure to be able to do this show for you. We love it, and we hope you guys had a good time, and we hope you enjoyed what we presented tonight. And we will see you all in a month. And I think next month, what did we decide on we were doing? 
The Lost Boys. That's right. Next month is going to be The Lost Boys. Time for a little vampire action. I think I should finally go get my fangs. Hit the fangs and like the one cross dangly earring. Hell yeah. And the leather jacket. I got the leather jacket. Right. I might I have to I go have get the earring. Character. I'm definitely going to have to get my fangs between now and then. You guys think I won't do that. You're mistaken. Too? Huh? <laughs> You're going to wear the contacts too? I don't know. I have this weird thing about putting things on my eyes. Besides, I don't think even if I wore contacts, they would show up. Oh, it, I was talking about like the spooky contacts that are white. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could, but I still don't know. Well, they would show up, I guess. They, they'd be white. So, uh, but yeah, so next month, guys, Lost Boys, I, I hope you're ready for, for that because um, I don't even remember how we got to that, to the Lost Boys. Because we wanted to do something different, and then I we went through this whole try ADHD tangent of Corey Feldman, Carnival, Vampire. That's right, because you were like, let's do that movie about the vampires. And I was like, what movie are you talking about? Because you say vampire, and the first thing that comes to my mind is Bram Stoker's Dracula. And you're like, no, that's not it. And I was like, so give me something else. And you're like, I don't know, like dangly cross earring carnival. And both of us at the same time were like, Lost Boys. <laughs> ah. Anyways, guys, gals, and people of all ages, happiness and sizes, we will see you all. Uh the movies that traumatized us.